Space Technology Update Carbon Dioxide Rechargeable Batteries A new technology is being developed that could be a game changer for space exploration and colonization. This technology is based on a new battery system that uses carbon dioxide to charge a battery. Let's look at this technology and how it could be used. Life support systems are of critical importance when it comes to surviving in space. One of the major threats to survival is the fact that, while humans need oxygen to stay alive, too much carbon dioxide, even with plenty of oxygen, is fatal. The amount of carbon dioxide in the air on Earth has been rising steadily as our level 0.01 civilization continues to burn fossil fuels at a high rate. The current level of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere is about 412 parts per million. In the year 2000, it was 370 parts per million. That's an increase of 11% in two decades. While this contributes directly to global warming, it is nowhere near the level that would be fatal to breathe. A level of 100,000 parts per million, or about 10%, causes immediate unconsciousness, and in a few minutes, death will occur. At lower levels, but still above the normal level, it can cause intoxication, a drunken-like effect on the human brain. With high exposure to levels of carbon dioxide, the respiratory rate increases. Our brain stem actually triggers our breathing reflex as our carbon dioxide levels go up, not as our oxygen goes down. That is one reason why the current COVID-19 pandemic is so deadly. CO2 levels remain normal in this infection, while oxygen levels drop. The infected person does not feel short of breath and often just feels weak. Some have gone to the emergency room with oxygen levels of only 85%, which can rapidly lead to heart attack and death. 94 to 99% is normal. If the carbon dioxide level gets up to 5% or 50,000 parts per million, someone will develop hypercapnia, which is rapid breathing, and a condition called respiratory acidosis. CO2 is handled in the blood by converting it to bicarbonate, or HCO3, so it is water soluble. This causes the body's pH to drop and can interfere with normal protein and enzyme function. Intoxication will quickly develop. At a level of 10% or 100,000 parts per million, a person rapidly develops convulsions, coma, and death. Concentrations of 30% or more are almost instantly fatal. In spacecraft and on colonies on the Moon and Mars, there will not initially be large greenhouses producing enough oxygen to survive. Gas permeable water cylinders with oxygen producing algae have been considered and will help, but primary systems for everything but massive spacecraft and backup systems for large colonies will be necessary for this foreseeable future. On the Apollo missions, the ships carried oxygen to keep the oxygen level up, purging excess to relieve pressure, and then had carbon dioxide absorbing chemicals to use in canisters to keep the CO2 levels down. Everyone who saw Apollo 13 knows that the CO2 canisters on the lunar excursion module were round, while the ones on the command module were square. These canisters contain a chemical called lithium hydroxide. This chemical absorbs carbon dioxide out of the air. Once saturated, the canister is discarded. Running out of canisters before completion of the mission would be bad. In Apollo 13, they had all three astronauts staying in the command module with no trip to the moon for two of them. This started saturating the CO2 canisters faster than planned and required the crew to take the canisters from the lunar excursion module and modify them to work with the command module systems. The oxygen for Apollo was supplied by onboard cryogenic tanks of liquid oxygen. The International Space Station works very differently. It has an oxygen generation assembly that uses water electrolysis to separate hydrogen and oxygen and can produce 2.3 to 9 kilograms of oxygen a day, usually running at 5.4 kilograms per day. The average human requires 1 kilogram of oxygen per day at a normal activity level. The ISS also has a carbon dioxide reduction assembly, or CREA. The hydrogen from the oxygen generation system is combined with the CO2 drawn from the ISS air to produce water and methane using the Sabatier reaction. The Sabatier reaction uses a nickel catalyst to react heated and pressurized hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide, producing water and methane. This is the reaction method that Dr. Robert Zubrin of the Mars Society and Elon Musk of SpaceX have put forward to produce rocket fuel on Mars. This reaction requires energy input to heat and pressurize the gases for the nickel catalyst to be effective. So the Apollo missions brought along tanks of liquid oxygen and carbon dioxide absorbing canisters 
for their trip to the moon, which lasted about 10 days. The ISS is designed for long-term habitation, with around five astronauts on board most of the time, and uses water electrolysis to produce oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen is used for breathing, and the hydrogen is sent to the carbon dioxide reduction assembly, which pulls carbon dioxide from the air, pressurizes it and heats it, and combines it with the hydrogen in the Sabatier reaction to produce water and methane. The water can be used for drinking or recycled through the oxygen generator assembly, and the methane could be stored for rocket fuel or put through a methane fuel cell to produce power. The Sabatier reactor is composed of a furnace to heat the hydrogen and carbon dioxide, a multi-stage compressor to pressurize the gases, the nickel catalyst to accomplish the chemical reaction, and a condenser and phase separation system to concentrate the water and methane separately. The other method of producing oxygen is the solid fuel oxygen generator or oxygen candle. If you watched the movie Life, you saw these in action. These have sodium chlorate and iron powder. The iron burns generating heat and reacts with the sodium chlorate to produce sodium chloride and oxygen. One of these oxygen candle canisters on the ISS can supply enough oxygen for one day. These are not reusable. The system is also used on commercial airplanes in case of emergency to produce oxygen in case of depressurization. You can also use zeolite and activated charcoal to remove carbon dioxide and trace gases. Zeolite is an aluminosilicate mineral that has many industrial purposes and is of interest to scientists hoping to reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide. It is also not reusable. So the best system for recycled life support that we have currently requires water, carbon dioxide, and continuous power, and quite a bit of power. For our spaceships and colonies on the moon and Mars, we should use active power generation with a radioisotope thermal generator if possible. If we don't have a nuclear reactor, we should also use solar, but when it fails or is not available due to dust storms or the 15-day night on the moon, the solar panels should be backed up by hydrogen or methane fuel cells, as well as perhaps a gravity battery. A gravity battery is when you pull a heavy weight above the ground or up a slope when you have excess power, and then use the force of gravity to generate power as the weight moves back down. Now to the new technology. A new battery system has been designed by the University of Illinois at Chicago. This battery system is able to use carbon dioxide gas to charge a battery and produce electricity. You heard me right. The atmosphere of Mars, or the exhalations of colonists on the moon, can be used to produce power. In fact, these lithium carbon dioxide batteries have an energy density seven times higher than lithium ion. Other scientists had developed similar batteries in the past, but they could not be recharged. The new battery design is fully rechargeable, and the prototype has survived over 500 charge-discharge cycles. Most of the older lithium carbon dioxide batteries produced lithium carbonate and carbon. In these older batteries, the lithium carbonate recycles, but the carbon builds up in the catalyst, leading to the battery's failure. New materials have made it possible to recycle both the lithium carbonate and carbon. Molybdenum disulfide, as a cathode catalyst with a hybrid electrolyte, helps to incorporate the carbon into the recycling process. This is a game changer. The unmanned starships can now land on Mars, power themselves off the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, with hydrogen from onboard tanks to help power the Sabatier process and produce the fuel they will need to get back to Earth. Once the process is started, it produces heat that can be recycled to the furnace. For spaceships, power can be produced as the carbon dioxide is absorbed. This creates an amazing potential for emergency backup power, as well as a way to power spacesuits almost indefinitely. We have to keep track of technology like this, as rapidly applying it to the space industry can solve many problems. Thanks for listening and stay safe.